my name is Guy Wallace and in this video today my question for you is are you producing innovative curriculum, performance based curriculum, or old school curriculum? Innovative curriculum is the result of innovative methods and processes, not old school methods and processes. That innovation in the learning space should lead to performance improvement. I've been doing this since 1982. Our methods ensure a performance-based modular curriculum one that will increase performance impact, increase the reuse of the modular designs, which then leads to reduced development, inventory, administrative, deployment, and maintenance costs. A curriculum of modules is not a modular curriculum. Curriculum architecture is known by many names learning architecture, instructional architecture, training architecture, etc. The curriculum architecture processes produce learning paths or training paths or development roadmaps, training blueprints, etc. These have been known by many different names since I began doing these in 1982. The first published reference to curriculum architecture was in Training Magazine in September 1984. I was a co-author of this article. The task, according to the editors at Training Magazine, was to create a coherent training curriculum, a curriculum architecture that will pay off for your entire organization. The recommended construction method, group process. This was true then, and it's still true today. What's innovative about this, and what was innovative back then in 1984, was the approach using a group process that would establish the customer and client's ownership of the products of a curriculum architecture design effort. This includes curriculum, instruction, training, learning, and even knowledge management. I first presented on curriculum architecture design via a group process at the NSPI conference in 1985. My book, Almost 20 Years in the Making, Lean ISD, was finally published in 1999. In 2011, I updated the Lean ISD book into a configuration of several books, two of which focus specifically on curriculum architecture design. The upfront analysis portion covered in analysis of performance competence requirements, and then the PAC processes for performance-based curriculum architecture design. There are four phases to the typical approach to curriculum architecture design, however these can be reconfigured as needed. Each phase produces specified deliverables and each phase involves specific teams of master performers and clients and other stakeholders. The methods that I've been using since my first project in 1982 are innovative in that the group process approach is quite innovative, was quite innovative then, and seems to be quite innovative still today. An example path from the mid-1980s is this one for product managers. This next path was for participants in clinical trial processes. 
This path was for supervisors at a United States Navy shipyard. However, this project produced two paths, one for the supervisors and another path for the zone managers. The concept was that the learning path, the learning curve, involved going from a supervisor's job to the zone manager's job. This path was produced in a project that involved the development of seven training and development paths. The difference in the paths were due to the different regions that the customer's training organization resided in. And they were responsible for call center salespeople who sold in designated states, each with their own different laws, regulations, and codes, driving a differential in the product configurations. Sometimes call waiting could be bundled with call forwarding, and at other times not. We designed over 1,800 content objects, which in the PAC processes we refer to as instructional activities. About a quarter of them were shared across all seven paths, with over 1,400 unique instructional activities. A curriculum architecture design that's going to impact performance must be based on detailed performance model data, not high-level descriptions of sales call efforts. The performance models lead to a detailing of specific knowledge and skills. I use 17 categories of knowledge and skills to systematically derive those enablers. We also look at the existing training and development to assess whether it's got any reuse potential, either as is, or after modification, or not appropriate for this particular situation. I've done over 70 projects myself in the curriculum architecture design space, but my partners and my staff and my client staff who I trained and developed and sometimes certified have done even more. The methodologies have been proven across many different industries, many different job types, including individual contributor jobs and managerial jobs. The curriculum architecture design methodology that I use and teach has been field tested and proven hundreds and hundreds of times. Performance-based learning or curriculum or training or instructional architecture design is all about performance by design versus performance by chance. Performance improvement by design is not done through some haphazard, old-school approaches. The typical questions about curriculum architecture design is, how long does this take? Well, the typical project is 20 to 40 business days, but can be done much quicker. It can be done in as quick as five days, or probably more closely to 10 days. A project steering team may be involved for upwards of two full days across four different meetings. This provides them with the command and control opportunities to make sure that they get exactly what they need and what will have an impact to performance. They make the business decisions inherent in a curriculum architecture design project, not the instructional designers. A typical project also involves up to six days of master performer time in facilitated meetings. The number of master performers one might bring together for an effort like this is somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 12. 
the late Gary Rummler wrote about these methodologies in 1999. If you want to ground your fantasy of a corporate university with the reality of a sound engineering approach to instructional systems that will provide results, you should learn about the PAC processes. If you are the leader of or a serious participant in the design and implementation of a large-scale corporate curriculum, then this book is for you. This system could be the difference between achieving bottom line results with your training or being just another little red schoolhouse. Mickey Lane, senior partner at MVM, the communications group, wrote in 1999, Lean ISD takes all the theory, books, courses, and pseudo job aids that are currently on the market about instructional systems design and blows them out of the water. Previous systems approach books showed a lot of big boxes and diagrams which were supposed to help the reader become proficient in the design process. Here is a book that actually includes all of the information that fell through the cracks of the other ISD training materials and shows you the way to actually get from one step to another. Guy adds all the caveats and tips he has learned in more than 20 years of ISD practice and sprinkles them as job aids and stories throughout the book. However, the most critical part of the book, for me, was that Guy included the project and people management elements of ISD in the book. Too often, ISD models and materials forget that we are working with real people in getting the work done. This book helps explain and illustrate best practices in ensuring success in ISD projects. Are you producing innovative curriculum, performance-based curriculum, or old-school curriculum?